PFAS are a class of chemicals. There's about 3,000 of them in total. Um, and the PFAS stands for per- and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Uh, they were developed back in the 1930s and they're defined by a chain of carbons that each of those carbons has multiple fluorine atoms attached to it. And the reason that they were developed is uh, for properties of oil resistance, water resistance, friction resistance, and temperature resistance. So they've ended up in a lot of consumer products over the years. Basically anything that is either stain or water resistant has PFAS as part of that. So uh, some things you here have uh, Scotchgard or Gore-Tex, things like jackets, boots, carpets, uh, upholstery on furniture or car seats, those all have PFAS in them. Um, also, uh, anything that has Teflon in it, um, so pans that are non-stick, uh, uh, pipe wrap, things like that, that's uh, all made from PFAS. Um, PFAS is also found in a lot of commercial products like uh, makeup and sunscreen. And then the one of the most common ways that uh, uh, PFAS has been used is in something called AFFF, which stands for Aqueous Film Forming Foam. And what that's used for is to fight fires uh, generally that are fuel related. So you'll find that at uh, airports and gas stations and chemical manufacturers and military bases, any place where there's a lot of fuel storage, typically will have a foam firefighting system that has AFFF in it. Well, here in Michigan, we have a couple of high profile sites, uh, a couple of military bases and a, a manufacturer that have had some clear releases of PFAS and they've impacted people's drinking water. So that's really caught a lot of attention here in Michigan where just a few years ago we had a big issue with drinking water with lead in Flint and I think that's kind of carried over and people's consciousness are on it. So our current administration in Michigan is very sensitive to the issue and is trying to get out in front of it. So they're, they've established a uh, science advisory committee to advise the governor on these issues and they've been out testing water supplies and also testing wastewater which then ends up in surface water and so they've been trying to find out uh, which uh, businesses in the state and which uh, entities in the state are using PFAS and potentially putting them into the environment. I'll answer that kind of. Um, the US EPA issued a lifetime health advisory back in 2016 of 70 parts per trillion and that applies to the combination of PFOA and PFOS. Now unfortunately that's not an enforceable level, it's only an advisory level at this point. Um, the US EPA has not established an MCL under the Safe Drinking Water Act and that would typically be how they would set an enforceable level for a chemical. Well, the human health concerns are still being figured out. Um, the toxicology related to PFAS is still kind of in its infancy right now, and we don't know exactly what effects they have and at what levels. Some of the things that are suspected are developmental effects, immune system effects, and uh, potentially even cancer. But the, the exact level at which those things happen um, is still not confirmed. The other thing that they're still looking into is what are the synergistic effects of multiple PFAS chemicals on a person? Most times, uh, if they're exposed to PFAS, it's not just one of the chemicals. Remember, there's 3,000 of these chemicals, and usually there's more than one of those that's present, and what we don't know very much at all is how those interact and what, what kind of effects when you have multiple PFAS chemicals that a person may be in their drinking water. Many states are, um, particularly those that have known problems, uh, are establishing their own criteria independent of any federal action. So some of the, the states, have, like Michigan, have adopted the EPA health advisory level as their groundwater cleanup criteria. Some other states are higher, and there's some other states that are going lower, such as New Jersey and Vermont and Minnesota, have criteria that are quite a bit lower than the US, US EPA health advisory. There's a couple of important differences between PFAS and the way that it behaves versus some of the more traditional contaminants that we have. 
The first one is PFAS is very soluble. It goes into the water phase and travels with the water and thus is pretty mobile. Um, because it, it's soluble and doesn't stick to the soil like some of these other chemicals, it may move faster if it's in the same plume as something like TCE or something like gasoline. Um, the other thing that is uh, unique about PFAS is it's persistent. That carbon fluorine bond is really hard to break apart. So there aren't a lot of natural processes that break PFAS down in the ground. It usually stays there. Uh, the last thing that is unique uh, somewhat about PFAS is it's bioaccumulative. So if someone were to be exposed to it through drinking water or any other way, it will build up in their fat cells and over time, if with repeated exposure, the levels in the body will continually go up. Well, because we're sampling to a really low level and PFAS are present in so many commercial products, there's a potential for the things that we wear and the things that we use while sampling to impact the sample results. So what we've tried to do is make sure that our staff, when they are sampling, are keeping as many of those products as possible out of the system. So things like cosmetics and sunscreen and Teflon liners and certain types of plastics, trying to make sure that those aren't involved in the sampling to make sure we're not having false positives because this data that we're basing this on at such low levels can have really high monetary impacts if you're deciding on our remediation system. Well, there's a couple of things with PFAS remediation that are different than a lot of the other contaminants that we deal with. One of the most critical is that there aren't any good ways right now to break PFAS down in the ground. So generally, we have to pump it up out of the ground and deal with it at the surface. And the way that most people are doing that right now is through activated carbon. So the PFAS sticks to the activated carbon and then you take the activated carbon somewhere and you put it through usually an incineration process to break down the PFAS. Um, the other way that people are, you are uh, remediating um, PFAS above ground is through ion exchange. And so that's another way that it gets taken out of the water stream and kind of concentrated, then you have to deal with it elsewhere.